Hi, my name is Scott Simpson and today I'll be talking about chirality. Now, um, chirality is handedness, or it's known as the Greek word for handedness, and molecules themselves can also be chiral. For example, the models I have right up front here are chiral because um, you have non-superimposable mirror images of one another. So if we look at these two, they're mirror images of one another, but if we try and overlay them on top of one another, we find that they do not match up. And it happens to be a form of isomerism. So today we're going to cover how to determine if something is chiral um, using uh, Lewis structures to show chirality and things along those lines. So but before we do that, we have to cover what is chirality. So it's the Greek word for handedness. And what results are, there are basically two mirror images of one another, and they're non-superimposable. So for example, if you look at your hands, your hands are mirror images of one another, but they do not exactly match up if you try and overlay the two. And these mirror images are known as enantiomers. Enantiomers. Sorry, I spelled that to begin with. Um, so let's talk a little bit about enantiomers. So we previously said that they're non-superimposable images of one another. So that's when you get um, stereoisomers that are not mirror images of one another. So they're not, I mean, they are mirror images of one another, but they're non-superimposable. Mirror images. So they're non-superimposable. Like I showed you with those models, you can't overlay the two on top of one another. And you can have two types of substances um, you can have either chiral or achiral. In the case of chiral, we have handedness. And in the case of achiral, we do not have. So, let's do an actual molecular example. What we're going to be looking at is cis-1,2-difluoro-cyclopentane and trans-1,2-cyclopentadiene. So, cis-1,2-difluoro-cyclopentane. And then we have the transform. So first, let's just draw out our ring. And keeping with the IUPAC convention, we have the first and second position, and they're cis to one another, so they lie on the same face. Uh, we'll designate our H's, even though we really don't have to. And remember, wedges are coming out of the board, H's are going into the board. Now, if we take a mirror image of this molecule, what we will find is we end up getting the same molecule back out. So this system would be termed achiral. In the case of the trans isomer, let's try and see what happens there. So they're on opposite sides, or opposite faces, the fluorines are. So 
something like that. Let's take the mirror image of it. Do we end up getting the same result? Well, if I could draw a halfway decent, in this case, we're getting our mirror image. And you can see, for the trans case, we do in fact not get mirror images of one another. So this or we do have mirror images of one another, but we find that they're non-superimposable. If we try and flip the left onto the right, we'll find that they never perfectly match up. So this would be chiral. And we can spot out centers of chirality. So at points where you can see if something is chiral or not. So points of chirality. So this is a point, it's just a point of chirality, and you have four different substituents at a carbon. So whenever you're looking for a stereo center, all you're actually doing is looking at a carbon and seeing where you have four different groups bonded to it. So let's take a look of, at two examples. So in this case, the point of chirality would be where we have a carbon with four substituents at that point. All of the carbons except for this one right here do not. So that would be a point of chirality because you can see on this side you have a propyl attached, on this side you have a methyl and a hydroxyl, and you also have a hydrogen which is implicitly or explicitly stated in this case. And then for our next example, Let's look at a ring compound. We have fluorine, chlorine. In this case, we do have a ring, and we have to mark off the points of chirality. And even though the ring itself is attached, what you can say is you find a point of symmetry, and you determine if it's the same on both sides. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark our two stereo centers first, and then I'm going to explain where those planes come into play. So we want to bisect through a sigma bond. Oops, kind of did that crummy. Actually, should have gone down here. And you can see that these and do not have a mirror plane of symmetry cutting through the central um, pi system. In the case of chlorine, if we cut it up this way, we also see that it's not symmetric. So this half would be different than this half, which would give this molecule an overall two uh, chirality centers. But we can be a little more descriptive than just saying something is chiral. We can say something has um, an R or an S type chirality to it. So how do we determine those? So if something is R or S, so assign R or S. So before we get into assigning if something is R or S, there are basically two rules that you have to um, be aware of before you can assign this R and S. So each, what you do is you look at each chiral center, and in the case 
of, let's just say, a carbon. Let's look at ER and S. Type in antimers that we can have. So you'll see that these are mirror images of one another. And what you do is you assign a priority. Two substituents. So in this case, we have our two carbons. We've already assigned a chirality to them, except I left this one out. And what you do is you see which way the molecule turns. And what I mean by that is you draw arrows going from the highest priority to the lowest priority. And what you do is you typically put the top three priority substituents in the same plane, and you put the fourth one in the back and you neglect the fourth so you do not draw any arrows to the fourth. So in this case, we'd be drawing arrows from one to two, two to three, and then back to one. In this case, going one to two, two to three, to one. And the way you can think about it is like turning the steering wheel in your car. In this case, this one would be R. And this one would be S. So if you think about it in terms of driving a car, you want to turn right, you turn that way, R, right. You want to turn left, you turn this way. In that case, it's S. So knowing that, we have to know how to assign the priority to our substituents. And what you typically do is go, it's determined by uh, atomic mass. So for example, iodine would have a higher priority than bromine, which would have a higher priority than fluorine, which would have a higher priority than carbon 13. Carbon 12 would have a lower priority than carbon 13, followed by H. And H has the lowest priority because it has the lowest atomic number, or I mean atomic mass, excuse me. So for tiebreakers, you move along each of the chains that you're looking at. So for example, let's say we had something like CH2, CH3, CH2, CH2F, CH2, CH2, I, CH2, CH2, ER. So this would actually be a chiral center right here. And we'd have to determine the priority of each one of these guys. So you start off at your first molecule and you move away from that. And these all have the same priority. You move to the next one and they all have the same priority you move to the third case. In this case, this one just has protons. So this one has, is going to have the lowest priority. We have fluorine, iodine, and bromine. If we go by atomic mass, this one has the highest atomic mass, followed by bromine, followed by fluorine. So the way it would go is you would have one, two, three, four. And that would be your priorities. So. Tiebreakers are determined by moving down the chain. All right. And then double bonds 
you actually count the atoms twice. So what do I mean by this? So if we look at, let's say, this system. What you would actually consider would be something more like this. So if you were moving to this guy, you would consider it to have two nitrogens attached to it. And that's how you determine priority of each of your groups. All right, so after you have determined your priority, what you do next is apply a 3D model to your system and rotate the lowest priority substituent in the back. So to apply 3D model, and then determine rotation of the molecule. So if it's R or S. And this is done by you apply a 3D model and then you prioritize each substituent and rotate the number four or the lowest priority to the back. So, for example, we're looking at a 3D model. In this case, let's do something like this, where two is coming out of the board. and three is going into the board. And what we want to do, we want to do a rotation so that four is going into the back of the board. So it's four and three are gonna switch positions. But you have to think about it in terms of rotating a molecule. So if we have our simple model, which may be useful for you to buy or have while you're studying these systems, if I, let's say we're doing something along the lines of this, and we want our orange ball to go where the white one is, what we have to do is apply a rotation, and if you see, it's now in the back, and we have our white ball over here now. So we have to account for that rotation. And after we do our rotations to get everything in the back, what we want to do is look at it kind of head on, like this and then assign our priorities and determine our chirality. So from this, if we were to rotate, like I just showed with the model, we'd end up with one at the top, four in the back, two still remains up front, and three moves. And now in order to do this, you may need to get very familiar with 3D models. Uh, it may be a good idea to kind of familiarize yourself a little bit further with these. All right, now let's take an actual chemical structure and try and determine its chirality. So, if we have This guy here. First, we have to determine where a chiral center is. So if we're looking at all of these carbons, the only one that has four different substituents on it is this one. So this is going to be your chiral center. All right. And now we have to assign priorities to each of our substituents. So remember, there's going to be a line that cuts through here. So our first priority, if we go one atom away, we have carbon, carbon, fluorine, hydrogen. So our fluorine is going to be number one, our hydrogen is going to be last. All right, now we have to determine our number two. 
So let's see, we already went one atom away. Let's move to the next. In this case, this guy has oxygen. In this case, it just has hydrogen. So what we're going to have to do is say that this one is number two, and this one's number three. If we go to draw a 3D rendering of this guy, just using ball and stick type drawings with our numbers. In this case, we have one here, four in the back, three up front, two up top. And now we want to orient it. So we're looking through the c-axis, and three, one, and two are all in the same plane. So we're going to rotate this guy around. Carbon, we're going to have two up here, three down here, one down here, and four is in the back. We really don't care about four. All right, now we have to determine which way does this molecule rotate. So let's draw. So in this case, we're driving our car. We're turning left, so this will be the S in antiomer. So if we wanted to draw the right in antiomer, you'd have to take a mirror image of this guy. Figure that out. All right, so hopefully I've shown you how to determine chirality of molecules, a little bit what chirality is. And uh, this is typically used in organic chemistry. I would suggest getting a model set to try and help yourself visualize these guys in three dimensions. With that, thank you very much, and uh, leave any comments or questions below.